is reinstated. Open sesame! Commander Klingon vessel. We are energizing transport of evil. Now. Welcome everyone to Star Trek from the Holodeck. This is the Lower Decks edition and we are here to talk and discuss the Star Trek Lower Decks animation, right? That would make sense. This is the Lower Decks edition, right, David? Oh yeah. And this this uh, series is growing on me like a parasite. Yeah. I would <laughs> I would definitely agree cuz we did get Another strong episode. He did. Uh, it is not as great as the previous episode, but still there was a definitive story being told. Uh, there was the fleshing out of characters. Everything that we would expect from a TV show, they did it. And Miracle of Miracles, Mike, they made me like Mariner. Uh, yeah. I also, wow. I also agree with that as well. So this episode, titled Cupid's Errant Arrow was directed by Kim Arndt and written by Ben Joseph. The synopsis, Mariner is suspicious of Boim, Boim? B- Boimler's, Boimler's new girlfriend. Tendi and Rutherford grow jealous of a bigger starship's gear. Yeah, Dave, I definitely say we're on a roll, but I'm going to put some question marks behind that. Okay. This episode was good. I know I enjoyed it. As I said, not as strong as the previous, but still something to be proud of for sure. Yes. With this episode, we have finished the first half of the season. And that's why I say question mark. Because out of five episodes, two were really good. Are we on a roll? Will we continue this trend? I hope so. We did close out the first half on a strong note. Is this proof that Mike McMahon... And the writers of Star Trek Lower Decks have found their stride. And, and I'm with you there. I'm really hoping that the the past two episodes is kind of like a precursor to a really well-thought-out series ending. I agree. Because, like, at this point, I have brand-new confidence in this team. I, which scares me, because... I hate being optimistic because then you're just disappointed. Yeah. But it's easy. It's easier with this series, too, because at least for me, it being a comedy. It's very easy for them to get back on a roll. Yeah. One of the biggest things they got to do is just work on their comedic timing. Right. And honestly, the the last two episodes, this one and the, the one prior to it, the comedic timing has been spot on. Well, they're there's they're, not been they're finessing forced. the humor. It's not being forced any longer. It, it, yeah, it feels like they're not just understanding the story they want to tell, but also they're cracking the comedy. They're finding their their beats. They're understanding when to do the joke and when not to. And I, I just and see in this, I, I, it kind of flabbergasts me a bit because in this day and age where we're doing streaming services and you're signed on for two seasons, you would think that the kinks would be worked out immediately. Th- these aren't the days yeah. of pilot episodes. We're like, ooh. I mean, yes, we still get pilot episodes, but they're starting to slowly and slowly becoming a thing of the past. Yeah. This isn't a pilot type of thing. You're not dealing with the oh wow that was that was rough. Uh, but you know the second episode was much stronger because they understood the story. It was no longer just simply a promotional tool to entice the executives at a network. We're dealing with streaming services. Yes. Star Trek Lower Decks was signed on for two years from the get go, so it makes you wonder what happened. Like, did they just say "eff it"? We finally found our stride in episode four. Just let's go with it. So and, and honestly, just like what you said, if this was like a series that was brought out like five years ago, this that would be fine, right? Because you would understand. You'd understand, yeah. And but, all, but they have time with a series like this. Like, exactly. oh shit, 
it's different. Coronavirus now. also slowed things down. They had tons of time yeah. to rework things. Tons of uh, tons of tons of opportunity. Yeah. So thankfully, I don't want to get into negative territory, but thankfully, it seems like they have worked through those growing pains. Oh yeah. And Lower Decks is doing what we wanted it to do. It's taking risks and being more than just simply a parody. It's building its own mythos, fleshing out not just our characters, but the Cerritos itself. Yeah, the Cerritos, the entire crew. Well, this It's is- not just about the four main characters of Mariner, Boimler, Tilly, and Rutherford. Yeah. We finally got to actually, it's about the crew, the crew of the Cerritos. Well, this, yeah, I would agree, definitely. But I'm also specifically talking about the Cerritos as a ship. Yeah, this is an too. important one for me because the importance of our locale, the ship's or even in in the case of Deep Space Nine, the station, they are characters. Mm -hmm. And we need to learn about that character and what makes them tick. And we'll get into this a little bit more in a moment. But I'm actually happy with this show, Dave, and I don't know how I feel about being happy (laughs) because I'm a person who's just not happy about a lot of things. A lot of things, And the fact that I push play and I fucking laugh my ass off during various moments of the episode when Mariner walks in on Boilermer naked, (laughs) I was fucking rolling. I was like, oh, shit, that reaction (laughs) that that uh, Quaid did. I mean, dude, I mean, that would be, I'd be, I don't think I can do that. As an actor, as an actor. Just, squeal just squeal and scream. Squeal and scream, yeah. <laughs> because I was like, going, you know, the the they made Bo- uh, Boimler in this Boimler, one. yes. They made him more personable in this episode because we could actually relate rather than to just him. simply being the butt of the yeah, joke. Yeah, being butt of the joke. Uh, yeah, y- you actually have character development with yeah. him, and I'm like going. I felt like Mariner where he's like, oh, you know, he's an idiot, but he's he's actually probably the most lovable idiot in this episode. Yeah. Because, you know, the things that he was going through is a, a typical simple things that any human being would go through. And that's what I really appreciated about this episode is like they didn't like blow it out of proportion. Like I think they would have if this was like still the same kind of uh frenetic energy they had in episodes two and three yeah it would not have worked here but because they downplayed it and kind of more or less made him more of a real character well it's comedy with purpose it's Dave. comedy with purpose yeah. and 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 i think that's what was the problem with the opening three episodes there was no purpose behind it there was no comedy with purpose this is comedy for the purposes of understanding our characters and fleshing them out yes. and moving a story forward when you look at what was actually happening in this episode it's actually pretty fucking smart the plot included three distinct stories running parallel that's some fucking writing right there all yeah. of this within 30 minutes under 30 minutes you had mariner and boy boimler boimler Tendi and Rutherford, and then you had Captain Carol Freeman's story. Dude, her, all story, of this, was, her story made me laugh when yeah, it started off. Her story was really good, and all of this, Dave, in under 30 minutes. This is how you write a fucking episode of TV, mm-hmm. whether it be a cartoon, live action, comedy, or drama. Yeah. It all worked. And the Mariner and, and Boimler stuff, Boimler, Boimler. eventually I'm going to get it. <laughs> the Mariner and Boimler stuff was probably the heart of the episode. As we continue to find reasons why we should like Mariner, yes. this is something you and I both struggled with since the very beginning. Why are we watching her? Why is she the lead? Why do we care? And this episode presented a solid case. We saw that Mariner really does care about something. And others. Yes. It was a bit of a fuck you to Boimler. No way could she like a guy like you, but it still works. The fact that Mariner is so flabbergasted that she's sure, she's so flabbergasted that a woman of quality would like Boimler that the entire thing unfolds in a comedic fashion Fashion. that works to express her care. For this character. Well, the uh, also the awesome part that they did was I think if they didn't do this one particular scene, I think the whole joke would have felt flat. But because they chose to actually show that flashback sequence, and I know me and you hate flashbacks, 
But in this regard, it only took two minutes. Yeah, for a series like this, it's okay. Yeah, for this, yeah, it actually helped because beforehand, I'm like, going, okay, Mariner's just being a dick because she has no, no confidence in Boimler. But then when you get to the point where she says, I remember my old crew, yeah. and she watched her friend get eaten by a doppelganger. <laughs> I'm like going, holy crap. Yeah, I can understand now Mariner. And all of a sudden, at that point, because it took me two uh, watches to, get, uh, to really dig into the episode. Mm-hmm. It was at that, the second time I watched it, and I get to that point, I'm like going, oh my god, I actually... I actually understand Mariner. Yeah. And at that point, everything that she did that basically could be misconstrued as being an asshole actually made sense because she was going crazy because she was like going, it has to be a doppelganger because that's what happens. Well, and I also, that's what happens in the universe. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. And I also agree, or I should say, I also liked that they're not necessarily making Mariner and Boimler a romantic thing. No. It's more of a friendship, friendship and the fact that Mariner is very protective of Boimler. And that is a charming aspect to any character. When you care about someone so much that you make yourself look stupid and you act like a frantic lunatic to protect your friend, that's something that's likable to most of us. And that's the biggest reason why I feel like after this episode, I finally can allow myself to like this character because yes. she's not just simply an asshole that goes around starting trouble for no reason. She actually cares about something. And again, you did this within 15 minutes of, of screen time. Of screen time. And th- that's that's really impressive when you compare it to the other episodes. And I'm more forgiving of the meta aspects because... The meta and the breaking the fourth wall is something that I didn't really want for a Star Trek show because I feel like that puts it into the par- the parody, parody genre. Yeah. And I, I don't really want a Star Trek parody, but I'm more forgiving and more patient with those meta breaking the fourth wall aspects when you have something at the heart of your show. Of your show, yeah. And it helps get that... It help get It, it helps get the... I'm trying to think of the word, but the uh, aesthetics mm-hmm. of the entire series get over. Right. It helps it get uh, basically feel makes us as Star Trek fans say, "Okay, this is a Star Trek series. We can get all. Uh, we can understand that basically all the decisions that are made, yes, might be affected by what we know in the Star Trek universe, but this series is now getting its own groove, its own personality. Right. And I. I think that's the thing that came out the clearest by the end of the episode. I'm glad you got the same gist from this episode because that's that's probably the biggest standout moment. And I'm not quite sure how to put words to it or where it was in this episode. But I feel like by the end of this episode, I felt this sense of relief. I felt like, okay, I can breathe easy that this show just found itself and it's not just an imitation. It's its own show. It's its own show. By the end of the episode, you feel like this is its own thing. Oh, well, Lower Decks. I get it. I feel it. I yeah. understand what you're doing. It shouldn't have taken five episodes. It shouldn't take five episodes. But, hey, we're here, and I feel like as a Star Trek fan, I can rest easy now because the show feels like its own thing. Yeah, and like the thing I really do appreciate about this episode in particular is you have multiple points for myself where I felt that, okay, we found the groove of this series, whether it's the ser- whether it's the scene that I told, uh, that I mentioned with just bringing that little element of Mariner's uh, back history in there and basically explaining why she's so paranoid, mm-hmm. but also in the very end, a part of me, maybe it's the negative part of me. Was it like expecting suddenly to find out that yes, everything that Mariner was uh, saying about the girlfriend being a parasite was going to come to fruition, right? Mm-hmm. And I would have, I'd be rolling my eyes at that point because that's the simple, yeah, that's the simple thing that you expect. Instead, they went a different route. And said, no, we're not going to even kill the the girlfriend off. 
It's just a misunderstanding between two characters who are thinking the exact same thing. Where I really like that, basically, the twist was finding out that Boimler's girlfriend had the same thoughts about Mariner, where she thought she was the parasite. Right, and also the fact that they kind of turned that whole parasite trope on its head. On its head. By essentially saying, yeah, there was a parasite, and it was attached to Boimler. Boimler. And that's the reason why this woman was attracted to a guy like Boimler. Yeah. Again, it's fucked up for Boimler, but I like how it wasn't what we expected. How it was treated. They subverted our expectation by saying, no, she's not the parasite or the changeling or the salt succubus. No, no. it was actually just something that was attached to Boimler's Boimler. head. And the thing was, is like, and I like the fact that they even took it further. And when Boimler kind of like very defeatedly looks at her and says, you just chose me because of the parasite. No, she, I'm a Starfleet says, officer. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and she basically said that she comes out and says, no, I like the person that you are and everything else. And I'm like going, that's really cool. Yeah. You, you, you subverted my expectation where the simple thing would be, yeah, it's the parasite. And she says, no, it's, it has nothing to do with the parasite. She likes all of the things about your personality the problem is right now she's she's a Starfleet officer first and foremost, and now she wants to focus all her work and time with this parasite. <laughs> yeah. So then we get Tendi and Rutherford, Dude, and I keep funny. loving these two more and more. The, their whole gimmick was hilarious in this one. Well, their whole nerdy competition they had going was great. Yes. It's just fun. I. The heart of the episode, as I said, was more about Boimler and Mariner. Yes. But Tendi and Rutherford was definitely the, I, I guess you can call it story B. And it was just more focused around comedy, but there's a little more to it as well. It wasn't necessarily about Tendi and Rutherford. This is the aspect I was talking about earlier in the show. It was a bit of a dual purpose. Purpose. Yes, we learn about these two and what makes them tick. But also, McMahon and his writers used this specific plot point to bring attention to the Cerritos as well. Yes. Our chosen locale is very important when it comes to Star Trek. We need to remember that in Trek, one of our most important characters, even above, yes, the captain, is in fact the ship yes. or station. And all these different iterations of starships and stations they all have their personality quirks all of them in fact i believe jordy in one episode fucked one <laughs> yes <laughs> or he had an attraction to one in the holodeck in that the was holodeck. basically the personification of the enterprise of right the enterprise yeah they all have their personalities <laughs> jordy when you touch that console, you're touching me. Isn't that something she's... Yes. Is that, what she's, <laughs> that, that was the most infamous thing. I was like, going, oh, it's so creepy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> if I'd be Jordy, I'm like going, I'm going to poke here well, and here well, and yeah. here. Picard and walks here. by. He's like, Jordy, why are you fingering that console so vigorously? <laughs> don't question me, don't Captain. Don't question me. Something's I'm, wrong with my visor. I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm blind. <laughs> Am I fingering this? <laughs> I thought I was writing something. I, I was writing something. Jordy, this is the future. We don't use pens and pencils. Oh! <laughs> Computer in program. <laughs> yeah. Dude, speaking of computer in program, that joke is the biggest nerd joke ever because anytime we fuck up in oh, life, yes. we say computer, computer in program. program. And the fact that Mariner... I mean, this is an ins this is written. This is why I know Mike McMahon is a Star Trek fan, because he's literally doing Star Trek jokes that me and my friends did in high school. Whenever something embarrassing happens, you say "holodeck" in pro or "computer <laughs> in program. program," and the fact that Mariner, which she can't believe that this hottie likes Boimler, Boimler Jesus, I keep stumbling over that word, Boimler. And she can't figure it out, so she says computer in program <laughs> as if they were in a holodeck was fucking amazing. Oh yeah, it was. That's what and that's what I mean. The comedic timing in this episode was really spot on. Yeah. And I like the fact that it all didn't fall on one character to make that character look like an idiot. Mariner was actually shown in the most flawed way this episode, and that helped her character. Absolutely. 
So, yeah, so bringing it back to Lower Decks, I, I want to say they essentially put the Cerritos on display and they contrasted it with the Vancouver. That's yeah. why they even had this other starship there. Well, dude, the, the, first, the first shot was, I thought was genius because I noticed it in the second go around mm -hmm. was you have the shot of the Cerritos, which is right above the moon, and suddenly the Vancouver just hovers right above right. it to, to kind of show that. The Vancouver is a far superior ship than the Cerritos, and the Cerritos looks like this insignificant little, you know, ship which, among all these other ships. Which is the point, yeah. Obviously, even it's the point of lower decks. You get the idea that the Cerritos may feel like it can't take the strain of space, of space. and or missions at times, but at the end of the day, it's a welcoming home. That's the reason why. Tendi and Rutherford wanted to stay. There's a sense of comfort of being aboard a quieter vessel. Vessel. And one thing is very clear by that analogy that you brought up that they actually embedded into the show. The Cerritos is written within the same archetype as the rest of the Lower Decks crew. Yes. He doesn't shine. He's not that great. <laughs> But I will get the job done. It'll get the job done. The Cerritos was characterized in this episode. And now suddenly, all is right in the world of Star Trek, in my opinion, yeah. when it comes to this show. Because that is what Star Trek has always done. Yeah. They characterize the ships. The ships with the crew. Because yeah. not just... And the thing that I thought was brilliant was... In this episode, not only did the four main characters, Tindy, Rutherford, Boimler, and Boim? Mar Boim? Boim? Boimler and Mariner, those those uh, the, the ship is a personification of them, mm. but I thought it was really important to show the rest of the crew and to personify the Cerritos towards its captain. Yeah, you needed to do that. Oh, that's why I thought it was genius that the yeah. third story dealt with Mariner's mom trying to be a captain. And she has to deal with this really messed up society and trying to actually play uh, play uh, peacekeeper among everybody. Well, it's and messed up, but it's also very much something. It's very on par with things we, we've actually seen. We've it's actually a high seen. end. It's a high end version. But these are scenarios we've seen in Star Trek before. Yes. Yeah, it is. They use that whole ready room captain trope. Everyone convene. Let's figure out the pros and cons. Do we save this alien species or let nature take its course? Do we risk the lives of one for another? I mean, they had the entire, in a comedic way, they even posed a philosophical question in comedy form. Yeah. They had it all in this episode, they Dave. This is Mike McMahon finally showing us, finally, in the last episode, but finally getting to the point of, yes, guys, I know what I'm doing. Chill out. I've always been a slow learner. That's why the first three episodes were a little rough. Rough. But I always come out on top. So get ready. So I'm actually really excited moving forward into episode six. And, and I understand why you said in the beginning of the show why you're very hesitant. Because it's kind of like we're so... We started off on such a bad foot. Now we're like going, when's the next shoe going to drop? Right. But like after this, I, I'm going to try to be more positive with the series. Yeah. And say, you know what? Let's give it a shot. Well, I'm it also going to two good episodes in a row. I'm also going to be more forgiving now, too. Once you prove that you can do something, I'm less quick to jump all over you about something that I may not agree with. And that's a good place you want to be when it comes to Michael Flores and David Zabal on Star Trek from <laughs> the holodeck. Trek. We give everyone the benefit of the doubt. We may jump on you a little too soon at times, but the moment you show us, the moment you flex on us, we appreciate that muscle. We appreciate it. Yeah. All right, let's go to a very quick break, Dave, and then when we get back, let's jump into callbacks and Easter eggs. Hopefully yeah. Some, hopefully some real Easter eggs. While we're at break, Dave, can you bring up a list of Easter eggs and we'll just kind of run through them? I'm sure there's some blog that put out some shitty Easter eggs. <laughs> yeah, sure. And you and I can go through that list and 
decide which ones we agree with and which ones we don't. Will do. We'll be right back. All right, everyone, make sure you pledge to our Patreon page. You can get more Star Trek from the Holodeck discussions every single month by subscribing. Head over to patreon.com slash Digital and pledge $5 or more a month and gain access to a plethora of Star Trek discussions, including our Star Trek pre-shows that we do. Pretty much before every single show, we do a secret discussion about various topics pertaining to Star Trek. So head over to patreon.com slash Digital and pledge All right, welcome back, everyone, to Star Trek from the Holodeck. Hello, David. Hello, everyone. All right. So we are here, and we are going to jump into Easter eggs. Do you have that list for us, Dave, or did I come back too early? No, I have a, I have a Easter egg list right in front of me. I'm losing my voice, so go ahead and go through that list. Okay. Uh, let's just drump, uh, uh, drump. Let's jump right into this one. Or we can drump. That's fine. <laughs> So the first one that they bring up is the one as real as a hopped-up cue on Captain Picard Day. Boimler says his new girlfriend, Barb, is as real as a hopped-up cue on Captain Picard Day. Okay, is that a reference or an Easter egg? Well, of course, uh, they basically go on and say that the reference is to Q. Okay, but I would say that's a reference, not an Easter egg, right? Yes. Yeah. And then the Captain Picard Day is, is a reference to... Uh, the episode of the Pegasus where they find out about Captain Picard. Dude. Right, and also Shaban used that and in Shaban Picard. Used in Re- I think it's Remember. Hey guys, I watched one episode of TNG. This was it. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the one they do mention mm-hmm. is the one that you mentioned uh, prior to the break, oh, okay. which is Love on the Holodeck. When Mariner oh, did accuses, they really? Yeah, Boimler of having a holodeck girlfriend. Oh, that's amazing. He protests by saying, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> So that one's actually a good one. And also they mentioned about like the whole computer and program. That's amazing. <laughs> That's the best. So I would actually, I, I I would throw that as an Easter egg. Okay, fine. I, I probably wouldn't, but you can, I'll let you have the executive call on that. I would I would say that that's an Easter egg. Okay. The next one they have is the Jordi LaForge teddy bear. What? The Basically the teddy bear that uh, Boimler is carrying is a uh, Jordi LaForge teddy bear. From the TNG era. Huh. It It's supposed to be Jordy? Uh, it's supposed to be a, an actual toy that was released for the TNG era. Huh, interesting. Okay, well, if that's the case, that's definitely an Easter egg. And uh, the Philogian is another one. Mariner offers to set up Boimler with a Philogian who works on Cerritos and mentions she seems like a nice plant person. Hmm. Philogians are plant people. This race of plant-based aliens um, originated in the episode. That's not an Easter egg. That's continuity. That's continuity. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead. What's the next one? Would you have... agree with that? Would you agree with me on no? Yeah, I, I would agree with okay. you on that one. That's like saying every time there's a Klingon or a Romulan, oh, that's an Easter egg. Like, no, that's a species that lives in the world of Star Trek. That's called canon. That's called continuity. And I think the next one on their list, too, is also kind of like a continuity thing. Okay. Because they basically mentioned the 19, mentioning 1920 Chicago. Barb references to being stuck in the 1920 Chicago. Yeah, that's a reference to the Picard, TOS right? to a piece of the action. In which TNG? Is TOS. That's the, the famous Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes, of course. We covered the comic book version of that, right? Yep. Isn't that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know if I would consider it. I think that's more continuity. Than an Easter egg. Kind of reference, I guess. I'd call it a reference. And then... The I think these people are just dying for clicks, that they're calling everything an Easter egg. It seems like it, because the last one that they have here is Hunky Trek Dudes. Uh, intimidated by the hot hunk named Jet, Boimler uh, says, the guy is like Kirk Sunday with a trip Tucker Sprinkles. Hmm. See, that's just... That's parody. That's, that's parody. parody and breaking the fourth wall. That's not... We honestly should give a give out a lesson on how to properly do Easter eggs. Yeah, but then they would have nothing to talk about because ninety nine percent of the time these aren't Easter eggs. I think my favorite callback you could possibly call an Easter egg, and it's amazing that they don't have it on that list there. When 
Mariners trying to justify why Hottie McGee would like Boimler. And she says, she's an alien who's going to eat you, eat or you. a Romulan spy, or a salt succubus, or an android, or a changeling. Like, that's more of a reference. Yeah. You're would- breaking, or, or, I'm sorry, that's a little more of an Easter egg. Some of it you can call simply continuity, but there's specific things that she's referencing. Yeah, and when you see it in the background, because remember, she's actually going through like this weird conspiracy theory. Yeah. Like, red red line thing and you see all the pictures and you see a bunch of the <laughs> aliens that are shape yeah. changers on it. it that for me is an easter egg yeah i agree all right dave so this does bring us to the end of our discussion let's get into our final thoughts are you ready yep all right take us in uh, now i say this because people are going to be surprised with the score that oh I have. jesus it's not it's not very high and oh, it's not okay. very low. Okay. Uh, but the way with that we've been talking up this episode makes it seem like it, this deserves a higher score. Right. But I because of how we're looking at this series, I'm taking a very very serious look at like does this deserve to be considered one of the best Star Trek series capable series, okay? Right. So I'm going to first start off with by saying that I gave this episode an 80. I thought it was a very strong beats of the, the, the comedic timing was really good. I thought the story narratives, the three separate story narratives were really good. The only knock that I actually have here is the story just felt very safe. They didn't take a lot of gambles, but they chose little gambles toward the very end to mm-hmm. kind of bring it all together. Yeah, because your idea of taking a risk would be what we received in the last episode. Yes. With the whole ascension. With the whole ascension. That is pushing the envelope. Yes, yeah. I agree. I, and I was kind of waiting for a moment like that. So was I. I'm like, when is this going to go when over is it the go edge? over the edge? Yeah. They didn't go over the edge in this episode. No, I felt like they pulled back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I but, agree. But overall, it's a, still a very solid episode. That's the only negative that I actually have on my list about this episode. Most and, of like, and is it really a negative or just kind of, you know, did it meet your expectations? It did meet my expectations yeah. from the last one. And that just shows how good the last episode was. Because I think I gave, uh, here I gave the episode an 89, the yeah. last one. Mm-hmm. So I'm giving this one an 80. Okay. I agree with pretty much everything you just said. I wouldn't call it a negative in terms of pushing the envelope or playing it safe. I would just say, hey, expectations after episode four were a little higher, and I expected you to push that envelope again. Yeah. Because, again, to compare this to Rick and Morty, Rick and Morty pushes that envelope every, every episode. Every You're just like, episode. holy shit, they did it again. There's never a lull. So I was kind of waiting for that moment again. When... Is this going to be pushed to the edge? And it never really got there. So I do agree with that statement, Dave. I'm going to give this an RMD score of 82%. It's still a strong episode. I stand by the pros. I don't believe there are cons no. necessarily. Just expectations weren't met after the exceptional episode that we had previously. But overall, a good addition to Lower Decks. And it's also a good sign that... They are, in fact, continuing the trend that uh, I should say this positive trend that they're going in the right direction. And that's the biggest thing is like we're not expecting like 90s and we're not expecting like, you know, no. great pieces of work every single day. We want consistency. Consistency. And that's it. And show us that you understand what you're doing. And if you can give us a consistency with the next episode, that shows that you're, you actually have a game plan for the series. Exactly. All right, so this does bring us to the end of our discussion. I want to thank everyone for listening. Be sure to find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play. Just search Star Trek from the holodeck. Give us a review. Like those links. We need your help. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Live long and prosper.